Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I would like to thank COASIT and particularly Thomas Cumpriale for their never-ending assistance in helping us to run this group. As you know, we work hard to bring you interesting speakers and tonight we have no exception. We have two speakers tonight. Um, we, we have Amy Zarr from the Leichhardt Library, who is sitting over here, and she's going to tell us about the library and the collections that they've got. I went to the library on Monday. I was really blown away. I, I didn't expect the library so big. And the second uh, person I'd like to um, Welcome tonight is Melina Maqueta, Maqueta or Macheta. I can't get it right, but there she is over there, and she'll be here in a minute. Um, she's widely known, of course, for her book, Looking for Ella Brandi, and of course the other books that she has written and, uh, and had many awards, plus a film. Melina, I wanted to say something to you. You should have contacted me before you wrote the book. Now, you know, that might sound, I'm not an author, but you should have contacted me because I have a cousin called Alabrandi. And um, his name is Luigi. And I would have saved you a lot of trouble looking for Alabrandi because I knew where he was all the time. In fact, not only did I know where he was, but I've asked him to come tonight. And there he is, sitting up in the audience, somewhere, somewhere. Where is he? There he is, he's over there. So Luigi and Marisa, who are both my cousins, um, after I rang them the other day and told me my, my little plot, they've decided to come. So I think later, Luigi might want to talk to you and make sure that you got it all right about it. <laughs> The next speakers for the next couple of months till the end of the year will be Anthony Albanese next month, and I promise you he will be here even if I have to carry him. <laughs> what a story he has to tell, and it's a must come. So I hope everyone here and lots and lots of other people will come. The, other, the speaker after him is Loretta Balzar, and she is a Western Australian um, literary girl, she's coming to tell us all about books from Western Australia. And then the last speaker of the year is our shy uh, film man, uh, Tony Luciano. Now there's a lucky door prize under, um, uh, with a piece of paper under somebody's seat with an X on it. So I'd like everybody to stand up and have a look under their seat and see if they may have the lucky seat. And if you have, you've won, you've won a little prize from Bunnamanu Olive Grove, which is uh, an olive grove in the Hunter River, in the Hunter Valley at least. Wow, somebody found it. Thank you. I'm breathing to you. <laughs> Your committee is always trying to improve and make the group and our events more interesting. So please, if you have any ideas or you think you can help us, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, after the meeting, if anybody wants to come and talk to me, they can, and give me particulars of emails and so forth. Yep. Thank you. So I'll just be short and sweet. And thank you for having me here tonight. Um, my name is Amy Zarr. I'm the um, coordinator for history and heritage for the Inner West Council Libraries. That is the newly amalgamated council and the newly amalgamated libraries. So we are now um, eight libraries. If you haven't been to Leichhardt Library, we're just across here at the piazza, um, tucked away in the corner there. And um, I've just come tonight to talk a little bit about our collection. Because for the last six months, we've had the State Library of New South Wales Italian Multicultural Collection. So we've currently got 2,727 items in the overall Italian collection. And this includes DVDs, fiction and non-fiction, as well as, well as Italian magazines. So we encourage you all to come and borrow from that collection. 
Uh, what, that collection may go back to the State Library of New South Wales, but we also have a permanent collection, and my area is collecting local history. So we do oral histories, we do walking tours, we do exhibitions. So it'd be really wonderful if the Italian community continue to document their history and for that to become part of the collection. So we have um, about 600 photographs in our collection which cover St. Fiacas, the Arpia Club, Fishermen of Island Cove, um, the Philef collection which includes 30 archive boxes which are in our archives. So there's a lot of primary resources there to draw upon for writing, research and um, building up the Italian collection. So my area is local history, so we do document the Italians in the area that go back all the way to 1885. And I've got a little caption here from some of the research that we've got in our collection. Um, so some of those early Italians were Fishmonger, Angelo Pomabello, Carpenter Luigi Viega, Roof Street residents Angelo Di Lorenz, Andrea Fontana, and of course, all the Parramatta Road fruiterers, which um, were exhibited in an exhibition in 2010, which goes in very much a part of. The other wonderful project that um, occurred was the Fisherman of Iron Cove, where we partnered with the Australian Public History section of UTS and Leichhardt Library. And that covers the families of the Lasudos, Mirabito, Demento, the Goya, and Virtue families. We are also working with a team from council at the moment to put some memorabilia and honour boards down at Long Cove to commemorate the fishermen of Iron Cove. So that's something to look out for because it'll become part of a walking tour. The other area is celebrating local Italian businesses. So we've done walking tours in the past, one called Il Cibo, which looks at um, businesses where there's been three generations of Italians and you know we of course go around and eat lots of food and everyone's happy <laughs> <So> <laughs> and we always love to tell everyone that the first coffee machine in Sydney came to Leichhardt at Bar Sport so we've got something to be very proud of. So they're just little kind of snippets of what's in the collection but it would be really great going into the future of the libraries to do more projects with COASIT, with the Italian community. The public perception is that there's a lot of Italian culture in Leichhardt, so I think that story needs to, you know, be shared and told, you know, here at COASIT, with the library and as many cultural institutions as possible. So yeah, thank you for having me tonight. And if you have any questions, I'll be here till the end. Thank you. And Melina, if you come up and uh, take over, please. Incidentally, I, I should have told you that Melina's going to do her bit tonight with her mother because the other day when I was interviewing her, she said to me, you know, my mother knows more about all of this than I do, so I've got to bring my mother. I said, that's fine. So there we are. We've got a mother and daughter situation. Thank you. Um, so this is my mum, Del um, Marquetta, and it's, it is pronounced Marquetta, by the way. Um, I'll just... We, we haven't rehearsed this, but um, I just thought, you know, when I when I knew that I was going to do this. And then, I think coincidentally, I was about to say to my mum, come along, and she said, by the way, I'm coming along. And I thought, any information um, that I was going to get tonight was going to go come from her. So I thought, this is easier. And um, she's a big talker, so, um, and I promise you that if the microphones also go out, Anyone in my neighbourhood knows that they'd be able to hear my mother from a mile away. Oh, <laughs> um, but I just wanted to, um, and as I said, we don't know how we're going to do this, um, except we've got a few photos. I would like to talk um, about the past, about our history, but 
also how it ends up in my work. And I've got a few examples from my work, and not just Ella Brundy, it's just really surprising to people when I speak about the fact that, you know, I wrote a, a fantasy trilogy, um, and that fantasy trilogy was really four books in, and I feel sometimes that the first of um, those novels um, really kind of represented the themes of Whoopi Calabrundi as well. So I think that any genre you write in, something about your past always ends up there. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, especially that I was listening to Amy speak, um, I'm just, I, I, I'm, I consider myself a local girl. Like I grew up in the inner west, and the first time that I moved out of home at the grand old, old age, and this was such a big deal for an Italian girl of 29, can you believe it? Um, I moved to Leichhardt, and I remember my parents' reaction was, oh, why Leichhardt? The Italians moved out of Leichhardt. Why are you moving back in? <laughs> Um, but there's just something about Leichhardt that has just... I've been back to live here twice. I, I now live in, um, in Russell Lee. But I just feel as if there has always been something about Leichhardt that connects with me. But um, my uncle, my great-uncle, um, owned a butcher on Parramatta Road, um, the Castorinas, and I just... our childhood was... Um, absolutely consumed, I suppose, by family, and still is. And the one thing I always remember about that butcher is that they just made the most incredible, um, you know, sausages that I still feel as if I'm searching for those sausages in my life. But the one thing um, I thought you could talk about was, I wish we had that photo, because what a ridiculous thing to forget it. But um, when Marisa, when she was um, a little girl in Riella, um, they were asked because of Teal's connection with the area to... I don't know, they don't call them Prime Ministers or Premier, but uh, because of my uncle's connection, he knew them. And uh, he, uh, my eldest daughter, not Marlena, but Marisa, and her cousin, they represented the children, you know, and they gave him a koala bear. We had these beautiful photos of them that... I can't remember his name because if, I'm sure if I said it, you'd remember. But it's going back 50, yeah, nearly 50 years, you know. So it's a long time. But he, he came out here and it was at Leichhardt. It was at the... No, because I remember um, we grew up with that image because it ended up being, I think, in the... Um the Women's, Women's Weekly, Weekly. Yeah, and um, Marisa and Mariella were dressed in the Sicilian um, yeah, in national, the, you know... Oh, the Dalmina a costume, you know, the Sicilian one, yeah, because my husband's from Taormina, he was born in Taormina, I was born in Australia, but the connection with the, the Taormina's Sicilian costume and everything came out then. And just also how big a deal it was, I mean, it made the Women's Weekly, but I remember, we, I mean, we still have this image of just the crowd, I mean, I think that the whole of Parramatta Road would have oh, just yeah, been packed with, oh, it was with really people, big. so... Oh, you can imagine, it was... It was like, you know, Prime Minister going to, to Italy, say, our Prime Minister going to Italy. What, what would they call them? I don't know. It's not the Prime Minister. What do they call them? President. Sorry? President. Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, so my sister's claim to fame was that she made it into the media before I did um, at such a young age. Well, one of the things that I remember, um, I had to send a photo the other day to my publicist um, it had to be a retro photo, and I sent that one and this awful one of me in a bridesmaid dress, in a peach bridesmaid dress. And she said to me, she got back to me, she said, I just love that photo that you sent of um, you with your, they seem like relatives. And I didn't, I've always had that up for some reason. Um, I think it's because I'm vain and I really liked the way I looked in the photo, so that's why it stayed in my house all this time. Um, rather than for the better reason. And it was taken when I went to Italy for the first time when I was 19. And to go back a bit before that, and this is all tied in with the writing of Looking Fella Brundi, um, we, like Josephine Alabrundi, my sisters and I did grow up between two worlds. We weren't Italian enough for the Italian girls um, because my mum was born in Australia, but we weren't Aussie enough for the Aussie girls. Um, and the one thing I was always told was that if I went to Italy, when I went to Italy, I would just get off that plane and it would just be here, like I could feel it, you know, as soon as I got off that plane. And that's what people were saying. It was almost like they were having these 
you know, out-of-body experiences of what happened to them when they stepped on Italian soil. Um, so I waited for that moment, and of course it didn't happen. Um, and that wasn't a bad thing. I just remember being in Sicily um, and my great-aunts telling us stories. And I'll read a little part from Ella Brandi in a moment that was almost kind of word for word, but they told us about what it was like seeing that boat go in back in the 1950s when my father and his family came to Australia. And I came home um, from that trip and um, I started writing Looking for Ella Brandi and I just think that's a better reason for that photo being in my house than I look good in it. Um, but it was just such, it, it was a very symbolic trip, not because it was my first trip, but because there was just this beauty of sitting around with my great aunts and hearing the stories from the other side. I mean, we always, we were fortunate enough as the marketers to really grow up with all our aunts, uncles, cousins, and even up till today, it's ridiculous. We all live within a five minute radius of each other. I think my sister lives the furthest, and that's because she lives in Gladesville and the rest of us live in the noise. It's just, it's crazy. But the marketers have always had that, um, I, I'd say it's a, a, a fantastic thing that all the relatives, you know, were together. Um, so that was where it all began for me and one of the sad things that happened was my grandfather, and my mother's going to talk about him in a moment, um, he was a very tough man to us. He wasn't to my mother. He adored my mother, but I don't think he adored his... He, he loved us, but I don't think he understood his granddaughters. So my grandfather would always, when we saw him, because he lived in North Queensland, the only way he could communicate with us was to tell us stories about the past, and we were like, yeah, 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 we just ignore him. Um, and so I came back from Italy, I said to my mum, I really need to speak to Nonno, um, and I said, next time you go to Queensland, you've got to just, you know, tell him that I really need to talk to him. And she came back and she said, everything's gone, he got Alzheimer's, gone, just everything. So, the interesting thing about that for anyone who's read Looking Fella Brandy, it's a story of three generations of women, and it wasn't supposed to be a story of three generations of women. It was supposed to be a story about probably a girl speaking to a grandfather and finding out about the past. But what I was left with was my gorgeous, very ditzy grandmother, um, and she became a young Cartier Alla Brandy, and my paternal grandmother, the tougher one, was the older Katia Alagundi. Um, so that's kind of my lead in into it. And I just, I was just, you know, when I was talking to mum about this the other day, the one thing that's always fascinated us, my sisters and I, about our very tough, kind of grumpy grandfather was that when he came out here, we'd hear this story, and I don't know if it's true. I know one part of it's true because I saw it. I mean, we always saw it. But he had this topless mermaid tattooed on his shoulder. If you knew this man, it, it was just a paradox. Paradox. And he bought a horse. That was the story we were told. And I just always think of this. I think he was a wild man that was sadly tamed by just life. And we didn't get to meet him. And I don't know if my mother got to meet him. But that was... that young man who came out to Australia. So if you could maybe talk about when he did come out and... My father came out in 1927 and he was single then. And yeah, he, he, he just absolutely adored Australia because he found everything that he didn't have in Italy because it was all poor and there was no money and everything. So all of a sudden he had this money, he could buy a horse and to, for him to have a tattoo at that stage, must, you know, he was a rebel, you know, he must have been, I didn't see that rebel, because as we're saying, he was tamed by life. But he had a, 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 a tattoo of a mermaid on his arm, you know, and in Queensland, you don't wear shirts, you know, it's always hot, so you wear a singlet, so it was obvious all the time. But he came to Australia and he bought himself a sulky with the horse, he was just in love with Australia. Then he went back to Italy to get married after six years and with the intention that he was going to come back and they have in Queensland a cane cutting season that used to cut cane for six months. Six months there was no work. 
So that six months that he went to Wigley, he was going to get married and come back to work again in June. But what happened was he got pneumonia and didn't get married straight away. So by the time he got married, what, that he, he was lucky to get well, he got married to my mother and they, with all the paperwork, he got married in July, with all the paperwork that didn't work out, he didn't get back here till November. So in the meantime, they had to sell everything that he had bought here, everything that his young rebel life had bought, you know, to, to pay for all his doctor's bills. So he came back, my mother was pregnant. No work when he got back because the cane cutting season had finished. So that's what we're saying, that life really tamed him because then he had a wife to support, a, a baby, not me, it was my sister, and he went, he, there was no work, you know, for six months there was no work. So it's not like now you go on the dole, you just don't have money. And so that was his life, you know, it was a very hard life. He cut cane for 30, for 40 years. And anyone that knows anything about cutting cane, it's a really hard life, you know. So he was a worker, he worked all his life as much as he could, but he wasn't a very lucky man with money, so yeah, he had a hard life. So that's what Melina's saying, yeah, that tamed him. That, that's the dad that I knew, the hard-working, not the rebel that would have been. And that photo that Melina showed, it would have been his passport photo when he went to Whitley the first time that he was going to get married. But yeah, we lived in North Queensland all our lives until I got married and unfortunately, as Melina said, she lost everything because my dad used to tell us all the stories that were interesting, but it was, oh, here we go again, you know. So it's a lesson to all of you to get all the information from your parents and your grandparents because it all goes away. They may not get Alzheimer's, they may die, they may get sick. You lose it, it's so sad. My dad had such a lot of information to give Melina. So when does she decide to do it? When he gets Alzheimer's. Yeah, I did that on purpose. <laughs> um, so one of the things as well, and we, you know, we haven't spoken about Nonna, but my grandmother, um, and once again, you know, I, I haven't really read Alan Brundy for a really long time because I wrote it 25 years ago and there are moments that I just think, oh my goodness, how bad is this writing? And I know that people say, I love it, I love it, and I do too, but it is my first novel and I can't forgive myself sometimes for some really bad sentences. Um, but the one thing I, you know, and it, it got included in this was always remembering those stories of Nonna, because my grandmother um, was orphaned at a very, very young age. By the time she was five, both, her, no both her parents had died um, from illness. And, um, and her sisters were really strict. And there was always that story that um, there was a guy around who they almost locked her up in her room because, um, and I'll just read this scene, not a scene, it's a passage, about what did happen um, in both um, Sicily but also in Queensland by the sounds of things. Um, Carti is talking about, um, you know, getting engaged to um, her husband. Another girl, Teresa Morelli, had been engaged to a boy but her father found out that he had been with another woman so they finished it with him and she became engaged to someone else. But on the day before her wedding, she was walking down to wash her clothes and the first boy took her, eloped. Um, did she want to elope? Um, oh, no, 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 not Teresa, poor girl, but he took her away for a night and that was it. Nona Cardia wiped her hands clean in the air. He did not want her anymore and returned her to her family and she never married again. No man would ever have her. And there was this fear that that would happen with my grandmother because this boy who had been interested in her, her, her sisters and her brothers had found out something about him and they were really worried that he was going to pretty much um, run off with her without getting married. Um, and, you know, I have to say, I think she romanticised about him until she died in her 80s. Um, they're the stories that I remember from her. So those very fleet, like that flighty, I think, um, Cardia Alabrundi, who would tell stories about men who loved her, it just came from my grandmother never forgetting this, this boy because I think what she had with... My grandfather was certainly not a passion, it was just the way things were at the time. 
Um, so it, it was it was growing up. But they, those stories didn't happen all in one go. We we grew up with these stories, and the other story that has for me had a profound, um, I suppose, effect on our our family, but not in a bitter way, but was just my grandfather becoming um, an Australian citizen and... This is really funny because it's, it's sort of happening with all these things happening with the politicians. My father was, uh, was naturalised in 1933 and I was born in 1940. So my children would never be able to get an Italian passport. And they dearly wanted to get an Italian passport, the three of them. No hope. My husband was born in Italy but he was naturalised before they were born no hope, you know. So till today they always mourn the fact that they couldn't get this Italian citizenship. So if they wanted to be politicians then they would have been free, you know. They didn't have this problem. <laughs> we don't. Um, but what's, what would irritate me and still irritates me today and, um, you know, I don't think, um, I think it becomes a theme in a lot of my writing is, you know, this, these statements that, um, that my grandfather Salvatore um, formally renounced his allegiance to the Kingdom of Italy and has sworn allegiance to His Majesty King George V, his heirs and successors, um, either said Governor-General with the advice of the Federal Executive Council, grant to the said Salvatore Vecchio this certificate of naturalisation, whereby subject to the provisions of the above-mentioned Acts and of any other law affecting the rights of naturalised persons, the said Salvatore Vecchio becomes entitled to all political and other rights, powers and privileges and becomes subject to all the obligations, duties, go on. And I always think it's interesting that he was entitled to all these political rights and powers, in, you know, denouncing Italy in 1933 and still, you know, less than 10 years later, he was rounded up with all the other Italian men and, and put into a camp. And... Those story, that story of my grandfather getting put into camps, that's probably what I miss the most about what happened to him with the Alzheimer's because I just would really love to know about that life in a camp and that is gone. And he was a really, I mean, when my grandfather got Alzheimer's, he was about 80, wasn't, was he, he wasn't a young guy. So up till that stage, his knowledge, I think he could tell my mother every girl that was in her class when she was at school. That's how fantastic his memory. He knew everybody memory. in Italy. He knew everybody that, in his town and the next town. And he used to say to him, so and so, oh yeah, I know him. His, his son's that name and his wife's that name. He had the best memory in the world. So it was right ironic that he got Alzheimer's. But he knew everybody and anything. Yeah, and that's, that was a sad thing. And I just... And I think, you know, this is one of the things that we speak about often, that we have to start recording these, um, um, these stories, because my mother remembers... I mean, you wouldn't really remember too much because you were, so, you were so young, but if you can talk about what happened around that time. Um, and just the story that I think is the funniest is that boy who, when the police came to the door, knocked at the door and said, where's your father? You know, they used to round them up. All the, all the Italians, they'd come down the coast of Queensland and round up all the Italians, all the whatever, Sicilians, and um, take them, because they were supposed to have allegiance to Mussolini. And so they thought that, you know, because Italy was against uh, Australia in the war, that they would um, jump up and, you know, attack everybody. So that they would come along and come down the coast and knock on the door and take them away. And, you know, my father would hide that particular day so they wouldn't get him, but they'd come back another day and another day and collect them. But the funny thing was, they, they really thought these Italians were going to jump up and kill everybody. That was the funny part, you know, because my dad had a, some paint that he had left over and he had a shed that was a flat shed. So he got on it one day and he used to put his initials everywhere, so he had SV on the top of this shed. And the police came and said, why did you put your initials up there? Did you want the Germans to know where you were? That's how silly they were, you know. They really thought these Sicilians and Italians were all going to jump up and fight the war against them. So they rounded them all up, took them away. Well, Dad went to Cowra for a year, and then they took them to uh, Mount Gambia. And in the meantime, you know, my mum's left with two children all on her own, no one to look after them, you know. They, it was a town of just deserted wives. And that's what they did, you know. And for four years, 
there was no way that they would, even when they got together with, you know, that there was, uh, that Italy went against uh, Mussolini, they still didn't um, let him out. They just didn't let him out. My mum was very, very sick and they wrote letters saying, you know, tell him to come home to look after the children. There was no way. They just didn't believe that the, the Italians would not rebel and go with the uh, Germans. And that's, and that's the hardest, I think, um, you know, it's interesting, last year when I released um, Tell the Truth, Shame the Devil, completely different story. It's a crime novel, it's set in England, um, but it has to do with, um, to a certain, I mean, I, I don't, won't go into the storyline, but there is um, that idea of a wrongful imprisonment, you know, whether someone's going to believe it or not. Um, it's, it's about what's happening to, you know, Muslim people. And, you know, when people ask me about in what ways that connected to me, I've always had this fascination for wrongful imprisonment stories. I was very, um, like, I read everything there was to write about the Guildford Four. Um, anyone who's watched the movie In the Name of the Father, it's based on that. There's a, um, there's a documentary about the Memphis Three um, that I'm very fascinated with, and it's about three young men um, in, men, um, in, in the States who were arrested and put in jail for 20 years for um, the supposed murder of three little boys. And then there's the, um, the Central Park Five, a bunch of boys who were arrested for the rape of a woman in Central Park, put in jail for years. And what all those stories had in common were either class or race. And that brought it back to what happened to my grandfather. After you know, reading this document saying that I am entitled to all the privileges and that goes out the window because of something that's happening on the other side of the world. Um, and it wasn't just you know, men my grandfather's age, it was you know, if you were born in Italy and you were a young man, so you know, boys as young as 14. Yeah, as, long were, as, they were, as long as they were born in Italy, it didn't matter. They were not Australian, they just weren't counted as Australian, but they were still growing up in Australia. They were interned also with the, with the others. But the funny part, you know how we hear about now how the submarine came into the Sydney Harbour and how the Japanese were going to come through the top and everything? My mum used to say to me that when we were little, I was only two at the time, she said that they used to, because then they were on their own, you know, no, no men. And uh, she said, the Japanese are coming, and she said, we'd get, I'd get a couple of pair of uh, undies for you girls, put them in a bag, and then they'd run, you know. And I used to think, where did they get that idea that the Japanese were coming down? Because they were up the top, you know, in North Queensland. And they said, oh, no, they were going to come down from the top. And I used to think, yeah, mum used to fantasise. But now when you hear the history, they were. They were coming down. They were definitely, and they would have copped it the first, you know. But you hear all these stories and you think, yeah, sure. But also, I remember one of the stories, or two stories that Nunu would tell, or one of you, someone would tell. One was about these young boys in the camps and how the older men would have to put all their food together. Because if anyone has an adolescent boy in their home, they know how much they eat. And these poor boys um, weren't eating enough so that they'd give them all their food. Yeah, that, in the beginning, they just couldn't stand the Italians, you know, so they were treating them really badly. And the food wasn't going to go around enough, so as Melina said, you know, the younger men, younger, younger boys that were, anyone that's got sons know how hungry they are all the time. Well, these men, you know, the older ones would pool in and give them their food. But later on, they were treated better, you know, like in the beginning they weren't. Even on the train, they'd go past the stations and all the Australians would tell them off and you dagos, go away, you know, all that sort of thing. Nice to think, what did we do? You know, what did we do wrong? But that was it, you know. They, they were with Mussolini and Mussolini was against them. And that Although was there it. were people in the camp who were probably um, fascists and for yeah. Mussolini, but it was just like everyone got affected by it. And, and the other story I remember was um, the police knocked on the door and his little boy answered it and they said, where's your father? And he said, he's hiding behind the door. <laughs> Did that and I just remember he had a nickname um, called, like, the so rest of his life because of the fact that, you know, he told the police where his father was. He was only a kid. Um, but once again, I, and I just heard this, uh, I was listening to another writer who I respect um, who was doing research about the camps, um, not to do with Italians, but to do with the Japanese. 
And she, um, she said, you know, the Italians just accepted it, you know, not like the Japanese. And I thought, that's not really true at all. And, you know, one of the stories, or one of the things that irritates me the most um, about what happened was everyone saying, it was fine, everyone loved the Italians, they grew to love the Italians. You know, the Italians did so much in particular areas of South Australia with regards to farming, whatever. So it's almost like, let's forget it because it ended up being such a great situation. But as my mum said, you know, families went without their um, husbands, you know, for four years. And these men were rounded up and, and taken two or three states away um, because of this um, prejudice. And another story that I remember um, that stuck in my head, and I don't know where I heard this one, was um, that this, you know, one of the guys in the town, not in air, but in the Queensland town, was told to make all these sandwiches because they were going to be taking these um, Italians, you know, away and they had to feed them. So he spent the whole day making sandwiches, delivered them, and they said, can you get into the back of the, um, the truck? And he was one of the ones that had to get um, taken away. So all these stories as we were growing up, um, you know, somehow I felt found their way in whether it was this novel or whether it's, um, you know, when I was saying before, um, with the fantasy novel, Finnegan of the Rock, um, one of the things that I distinctly remember growing up, and it's always been such an issue that's driven me crazy, but my Italian's really poor. I was a very late speaker, and English was my first language. Um, and, you know, if you have a mother who speaks English, there was no way that I was going to speak Italian at home by the time I did speak. Um, and the one thing... That, the saddest part of that is I was very close to my paternal grandfather and I just thought he was probably one of the few people who really got me, um, got kind of my silence in a way. I was a bit of a wallflower when I was younger. And um, I remember that we were so connected with each other, but I didn't speak Italian or Sicilian. I understood it and he didn't speak English. And I sometimes think of all those amazing conversations we could have had because we were so interested in each other. I remember taking him to the tennis once and, you know, everyone was like, you can't, like, he was, had been sick, you know, as an older person. So the idea of someone taking him to the tennis, but he loved tennis and we went together. I don't think we spoke to each other, but it was just one of those bonds. So when I was writing Finnegan of the Rock, you know, one of the themes in it, um, you know, this idea of a kingdom where people, um, something happens, it's cursed, half the kingdom are stuck inside, the other half roam the land for the next 10 years. And the one thing that they stop doing, because they're so frightened to speak their language, they stop speaking their language to their young people because they're frightened of what people in the other kingdoms will do to them. Um, so what ends up happening is that between the generations, they don't know how to even communicate. And for me, that was a very extreme, I suppose, version of, you know, what happened to me. I had, I've got three daughters, and my eldest daughter, I spoke to them in Sicilian, no matter that I was born in Australia, I used to speak to them in Sicilian at home. Melina spoke when she was three, so she didn't sort of grasp it properly, but she was still spoken to in Sicilian. But she didn't get it as much as the others. And once, and the youngest one that was at home, she speaks Sicilian fluently. It was Melina who lost it because she didn't speak at all until she was three. And so they only suddenly realised that I could speak English at a certain stage, and that was the end of it. Why are you speaking to me in Sicilian? You could talk to me in English, they were going to school. Why are you speaking to me in Sicilian? So off they'd go in English. But I did my job, I taught them all, and so too bad if she didn't get it. Too bad if she didn't get it. But I was always considered, you know, it was always like it's, you know, there was just something so negative about it, and, you know, because it's, it's almost as if you're not ashamed, but you're ashamed of... Um, you know, the Italian culture, and my argument now is I think I've done enough for the Italian culture in this country to make up for the fact that I've never grasped the um, language. I, I don't feel any less Italian or more Italian, um, but I, I mean, I'd love to. I would love so much to just be able to rattle off um, in Italian, and the most ridiculous thing is that when I was teaching for 10 years, um, I ended up teaching Year 8 Italian um, and it was just the joke of my family 
um, but it was fantastic because I, I learned to conjugate verbs and, you know, I'm an expert on essere and avere as a result of that, so I'm very appreciative of being forced, you know, to do that, but um, it was always such an issue and, you know, I, I think, of course, I think it's important and, you know, it goes back to my nephews who, um, you know, they're Italian and Australian but they're, their father's Irish and my parents insisted on speaking to them in Sicilian when they were younger. And the argument today could be that they don't speak Italian, um, although we find out that my, one of my nephews is coming first in Italian, but we've never heard him speak a word in Italian. Um, but they've got the accent, and I think that that's the great thing about having heard um, the language. And I'll just read you a passage from Finnegan of the Rock that's got to do with what I was saying about language. I miss hearing our mother tongue, he found himself saying, speaking it. Sir Topher has always been strict about using only the language of the country we are in, but when I dream, it's in Lumiteran. Don't you love it? The way it comes from the throat, guttural and forced. Speaks to me of hard work, so different from the romance of the Belagonian and Austerian tongues. I miss the music of the voices in the crowded marketplace in my rock village, or in the king's court where everyone talked over the top of another. Then I will demand that you speak Lumetarian when we are alone, she said. Will you just, and why is that? And she says, because without our language, we have lost ourselves. Who are we without our words? And he says that they're scum of the earth. In some kingdoms, they have removed all traces of Lumetare from the exiles. We are in their land now, and we will speak their tongue or not at all, our punishment for the pathetic course of our lives. So men cease to speak, she says softly. Men who in Lumetere had voices loud and passionate, who provided for their families and were respected in their villages, now they sat in silence and relied on their children um, to translate for them as if they were helpless babes. Finnegan wondered what it did to a man who once stood proud. How could they pass on their stories without a language? That was just something that I remember, you know, growing up in the 70s and going to school, um, but also just leading up to that, just that idea of the, the shame. I mean, I would have to say that it was the shame that you were almost forced to feel um, and also the impact it did have on, um, you know, when I, when I see any migrant or any foreigner trying to speak English, it does take something away from their, um, the way they walk, the way they hold themselves. Sometimes that the lack of joining words, it makes something sound really aggressive. So someone will say, oh, that person was so aggressive. And I think, no, they just don't know their joining words. It's, it's the last thing that you learn, you know, with the language. So they were all these things that I remembered. Um, I remembered hearing people um, you know, call us names or call someone I knew names, and it was it was shame. It was, and the worst thing is, it wasn't being ashamed of yourself. You were almost ashamed of a parent or a grandparent. It was almost like you thought they were pathetic, and and that was one of the things that I really wanted to you know explore in our writing because it was just a different time. You know, when yeah, we were growing well, up. Melina, see, this is what happened when I was I was born in Australia. My parents never spoke English. My father learned to speak English pigeon type, you know, outside, but my mother didn't. And we weren't allowed to speak English at home. I had a sister that was five years older. We could speak English between ourselves, but we could not speak English to our parents, ever. Not to our relatives, not to anyone. So, of course, we became very fluent with Sicilian, you know, it was perfect. And when, when we went to school, we would be uh, Australian. And when we went home, we were Sicilian. But we, I've always been so proud of being Sicilian. Until today, to me, it's a second, like English is a second language. I always want to speak Sicilian. I find the Italian very hard because of the grammar, and I can speak Italian. But if I've got the opportunity to speak to someone who's Sicilian, well, I'll rattle off just like I'm speaking in English. And I'm really proud of it. So when we were little, we used to have to interpret for our parents. We used to go to the shops, they could never speak English, and we would, we would go to any shop at all and we'd go with our parents. We'd go to the doctors and we'd go with them. We'd have to interpret in every way. 
So I remember with my sister, it was a joke, you know. The only time we spoke to see to each other was when we were in the shops when we didn't want them to know what we were talking about. <laughs> it's just it's something that we do tend to um, you know we break out into. I remember once you can't sitting... do it now because everybody speaks Italian. No, but remember that time we were sitting around and we were just yapping, my sisters and mum, and the boys were at the table, and all of a sudden we switched into Sicilian. I remember Daniel said, "What happened?" And we're like, "Too bad for not learning how to speak the language." Exactly. You know? that, we don't want um, them to know what we're saying. But in in that passage, that's you know when he speaks about the what he loves about the guttural part of it is also the Sicilian that I was talking about because there was the next lot of racism I, you know, was subject to and from beautiful people as well. I mean, I love these people, but I remember being 17 and I went to business college and I found out something that was really a shock to me that um, Italians didn't like Sicilian, that people went on about Sicilians and they were telling me what their parents had to say about Sicilians and I remember going home to my mum and saying, did you know that people didn't like Sicilians, you know? Um, and it was a, a bit of a shock. And when I went to Italy once, I remember going to a lecture. I was up in Florence, and I went to a lecture about the way um, the, the North saw the South. And um, it was almost like, you know, um, what went on in, or what still goes on in the US, you know, um, there'd be signs saying, um, job, available, no Sicilians need oh, apply. Yeah. So it was just, it was such a shock to find out that this um, this strange language, because honestly, I do understand that Sicilian has just hacked the Italian language, but I just love the sound of it. It's, it's one thing um, that I do feel comfort if I, and I live in the, the an area of Five Dock and Russell Lee, where you still hear it spoken in the streets, um, but it's just always that shock to find out that people don't feel the same way about... I mean, it's probably not as bad now. Well, they used to say to us that long-legged Italy kicked poor Sicily into the Mediterranean Sea. You know, we were just rubbish. They used to make fun of us all the time. Um, so, yeah, it's just kind of... But the, we, we weren't aware of that growing up. We just thought it was fantastic because we had it all these... It never worried concerns. me. It never worried yeah. me. So um, that's the great photo of me, by the way, that I was talking about. But I'm not putting it up there because of, um, you know, just um, how ridiculous the perm was because I really didn't need a perm um, at that age. But my great aunt, like, that was my great aunt. And I just remember just that the beauty of, um, which I still think is important to me now, just this idea of all that dialogue that takes place around the table. Um, and that's where the information does come from. This once again shows living between two cultures and not just Italian and Australian. We also grew up being the daughter of, your know, daughters of someone born in Australia. And my mother, my parents are very religious. My mother was very religious or is very religious, but um, her religion came really from the Irish Catholic North Queensland. Um, and so that difference in a way between the, the Catholic religion that came from um, Italy was such a shock to her because um, I know that, um, you know, my mum being the only Australian born sister in law, daughter in law, it did set her apart. Um, and the one thing I remembered was the stories of our baptism. And I was asking my mum about it today, and she said, I am so angry about it. I thought, wow, you're still so angry after all these years. And she said, I don't want to tell that story. I said, no, tell it, because it shows the difference between... See, I, I was born in Australia, and my parents had come out from Italy a long time ago, and North Queensland is so laid back and everything. And we we're very Italian-Italian, but still different Australian-Italian. I got married into a family who had just come out from Italy about five or six years, and they were Italian, Italian to the extremes, you know. So I had to adjust to their all their customs and everything, and it was really, really hard, you know, because all of a sudden I was thrown into another world. And one of the things that Melina's saying is that I, I was brought up a Catholic at school, we went to school and everything, but the Italian Catholics have a lot of different things. Even though they're the same as, as the Australian, they have a lot of different things. So I had to adjust to that. 
And one of them was that when you christened a baby, you used to give the baby to the grand, the, the godparents, and you didn't go to the church. They used to say, they used to come back from the church with your baby baptised, and they'd say, um, "I gave, I gave, you gave me your baby as a pagan, and I'm turn, giving her back to you as a Christian." And I never was allowed to go to the church because that was the custom. Now, it was really strange to me. I wanted to go, but no, you can't go because that was the custom. So Melina thinks that I, because I'm saying I'm still angry that I never got to see my children get baptised, you know. And, and if you know my mother, it is just to me amazing that my mother didn't see her children baptised because I know how she feels about church and going to church and the whole thing. So, you know, it's just amazing to think of... Um, All the things you have a dust to just for peace. You know, peace in a family, you have to adjust to a lot of things, which the children of today don't understand, that that was something that you used to do, you know. You used to want to live in harmony with your extended family and you used to do those things. But I, I still feel strongly that I didn't go to those because to me it was really important. Imagine not going to your baby's christening. I don't know if any of you ever experienced that, but that was my husband's family's custom. That they came from Sicily and that's how they used to do it. Although I still don't understand why he got to go. So yeah, the father could go. That, the father could that's go. what I just thought. Let's not go into gender stuff here as well. But I just, the you know. Could go. Um, so I just want to. I don't even know how much time we've got. So. Because um, I also thought, I mean, I'll open it up to questions as well. Because sometimes we just wrap it on about things that you might be interested in. But. How are you? My name is Maria. I just want to ask you, what was it that prompted you to write your first book? Did you, did you always want to be a writer? And um, second of all, was there any time that you wanted to make that story a true story or was it always going to be a novel? I'm not an academic. I'm not really good at academic writing and my head is always in the clouds and that's one thing that, you know, I was told all my life. I was just always in another world. So for me, fiction, it's just fiction. Like, uh, you know, for me, my passion is fiction and it's not necessarily just um, novels, it, it's also scripts as well. Um, and with regards to, you know, why I wanted to write it, it did, the, you know, if I had to think of, um, there's a thousand reasons for it. But one of the things was that my mother put a book in my hand when I was five years old. Like, I distinctly remember the first chapter book or first, you know, big book that she put in my hand. We read all our lives. We were just, my mother's a passionate reader, she was a passionate reader, but not once did I read anything that reflected me. And there's this thing of, if you don't exist on the pages, you know, of a book, it's almost like I didn't exist outside the people I knew, those 200 people that I was saying, um, so I think there was this part of me that, you know, I just thought there are no stories out there about um, people like us. And that was probably, you know, the beginning of it. But also because my head was in the clouds and I just, you know, wanted to write stories. And I was very bad at writing stories when I was at school because when I look back on it now, and it still happens now, I'm not, I'm not bad at writing stories, but I will hand something into my editor and she'll ask me a few questions and I'll answer them and she'll say, that's amazing what you just said, but it's not on the page. And now when I think about it, what I wrote when I was at school, it was always, they were like probably little um, footprints without the story really being there. And that's one of the skills of getting that story on the page. When the um, Italians got picked up, they got chased up and taken down the Murray River, I remember a chap from... Um, uh, we were in Innisfail, Vince Messina, he told me the story that the only he came in 1917 to Australia and the only holiday he had was when he was interned on the Murray River and he had such a good time. But who cut the cane after they were rounded up? Sorry, the farmer's wives ran the farms. They, now I don't know about cutting the cane but they did a lot of the work. The farmer's wives did all the work while their husbands were interned. They didn't do it, they didn't make any money, they just kept it going.
well, there was an instance that I came across when I went to uh, Perth uh, a little time ago, uh, Fremantle on the wharf. There's uh, four big uh, 200 square posts sticking up with all the names of the fishermen on there. And, and they were Italians, predominantly Italians. And on the bottom is a plaque that says that during the war, the licenses were taken away from the Italian fishermen. But then within a few months, they found, the Aussies found, they couldn't get a fish to eat. So they gave them the license back. I can't remember his name at the moment, but the, the governor, the prime minister, the premier, whatever you want to call it at the time, was trying to get these people, these Italians, back onto the, because they had brought them out to Australia <coughs> to do all the manual labour, you know, because they, they used to cut the cane, they used to grow the vegetables that the Australians didn't do, but it didn't work. They wouldn't, they, the Australia went downhill with gross, um, with vegetables for a long, long time. But the, the people wouldn't do that job. They were the ones that did the job. All the Italians were the ones that were cutting the cane, who were doing the, the vegetables and all that sort of thing. So they didn't have it, they just went down here. Exactly. Dom. Thank you, Chris. I find this evening's talk very, very interesting. I recall when the war broke out, Mary Hell broke loose in Sydney too. Windows were smashed, food shops, so much happened. And even my life, when I was only about a 13 year old, they picked up my dad and turned him. But I want to ask a question to your mother. Did you not have the right of appeal? Because we did in Sydney. No. You had the right of appeal because the army intelligence would authorise the police to pick up anybody who could possibly be a security risk. So it depended entirely on the local police finding out from local people. Well, I'll just tell you this story about my mother. She, I was only two at the time when they took my dad and my sister was seven. And my mother wanted to, she didn't have any wood to, uh, to light the stove, you know, wooden stove. And so she, she wrote to my father and said, can I chop that big block of wood that we had in the backyard? And he said, he wrote back and said no, because he knew she wouldn't be able to do it. In the meantime, she had no wood, so she went out with the um, axe, got the axe and threw it onto the, the big block and lifted it up, because that was the only way she could get it to, to chop, and she just split all her insides. She just absolutely split all her insides. So she was an invalid with two kids. They wrote, my sister, who was uh, a seven at the time, even wrote to the Prime Minister to say, please send my dad home because my mother is, you know, black. she made up this letter herself. No way. This very uh, nice doctor um, said to her, I can sew you up, you know, because she couldn't even lift up a saucepan. And he sewed her up all, in, all her insides with stainless steel. And she was able to just get on with her life because she was a real worker, you know, she never gave up. Um, in my class at school, there, there were five Italians one of them was my cousin, the other one was Tony. <laughs> and uh, we got a really hard time, even when uh, Italy capitulated and uh, we were supposed to be on the right side, we really weren't. And, and it wasn't until in the 50s that really uh, to be Italian became fashionable. Thank you. Can we have a...